Living out here in the forest, it's easy to remember in some ways uh, our close connection with creation and you can probably hear some of the other creatures around me uh, as I talk to you for the next bit of time. But soon I'm going to be down at an airport uh, in a facility which uh, in some ways epitomises uh, human achievement in terms of separating ourselves from creation and uh, from the limits uh, of our physical bodies as I fly through the air in an aeroplane and end up down in Adelaide in a two billion dollar facility uh, which on the one hand uh, also epitomises the ability uh, of human beings to separate ourselves from the rest of creation or at least to uh, give ourselves the illusion that we have and in some ways in doing that we're doing what all creatures do birds build nests and animals dig tunnels to separate themselves uh, to some extent from the rest of creation around them and to make themselves safe but in this two billion dollar facility uh, there will be ample evidence that humans really have uh, at least some of us have gained an ability to do that uh, which no other creature has ever enjoyed at the same time because that facility is a hospital it'll be a poignant reminder of the fact that actually the idea that we're separated from the rest of creation is an illusion we come from the dust and at some point Despite medical intervention, we all return to the dust again. I'll actually be down there uh, to visit my mother who uh, is in the final stages of life. And in some ways that seems particularly appropriate uh, for this point in time and for this talk. As we talk about humanity and our relationship with the rest of creation, salvation, what that means for the whole of creation and where Jesus fits into it. Because when I became a Christian in my 20s, uh, after an initial period of focusing pretty much on uh, salvation for myself and working out what that meant, the next obvious question was, well, what about everybody else? And particularly for me, what about my mother? On the one hand, she wasn't perfect. On the other hand, she hardly seemed to deserve spending an eternity burning in the fires of hell. And so I really struggled to understand what salvation meant for others. At that stage, simply other human beings. Interestingly enough, my minister at the time, Rob Isles, uh, was a conservative evangelical, and he went on to be one of the founders of the evangelical members of the Uniting Church. And so we had a pretty heavy emphasis on Paul and the need to confess and believe in order to be saved. But at the same time, Rob talked about Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats, and he explained that that was a parable about the nations. So for the first Jewish Christians, that was a parable about everybody else that wasn't a Christian. What about them? And the story left open, of course, the idea that they would find salvation through their works. So uh, if you remember the story, the sheep are the people who've done good things like visiting those in prison, feeding the hungry, etc. And the goats didn't. And so they're sent away to torment. So on the one hand, that was kind of reassuring that it left the door open uh, for people like my mother to find salvation. On the other hand, it was kind of disturbing. For one thing, how would you work out where you sat on those scales? Uh, Mum didn't spend all her time visiting people in prison, in fact, any of her time, but she spent some time uh, clothing those who needed it and providing for the poor, but also lived a pretty comfortable middle-class lifestyle. So where would she fit on the scales? And in fact, where would anyone fit? Even more disturbingly, of course, the whole story is quite heretical. If it was on anybody else's lips, for example, if it wasn't in the Bible, but uh, we heard someone talking about it in the 19th century, we would have simply dismissed them. Or certainly when I was part of the evangelical church back then. The very idea that people's salvation depended on their works uh, was anathema to Paul's gospel of salvation by faith alone. So how does that fit into talking about eco-theology and Christ in creation today? Well, for me, it fits in in that Christ, or Jesus, said other heretical things that we tend not to focus on very much, but which I think are very important in when we deal with creation. To start with, of course, the early Jews, the early Jewish Christians, understood Jesus in terms of their creation stories. What else could they do? So we see in the Christian scriptures reference to Genesis, the creation of man and woman, 
uh, the first Adam through whom death enters the world, uh, which leads to Jesus, the second Adam. But now as Christians in the 21st century, we have new creation stories. Creation stories which take into account geology, the evolutionary sciences, which emphasize the fact that we are part of a billions of years long story of life. For billions and billions of years, life just went on before human beings ever came along. Creatures were born, they died. If they were lucky, they got to reproduce in the middle there. Life went on pain and death and mutation were part of God's creation for billions of years before humans came along. So the assumption in Genesis that somehow God created a perfect world free of death and that humans ruined that by uh, rebelling and therefore bringing death into the world doesn't make any sense to Christians in a post-Darwinian world. So how do we understand Jesus in this new creation story where there was no first Adam who brought death and pain into the world? Well, one way that a lot of Christian uh, theologians understand Jesus and we've heard about it uh, earlier today is to say that in Christ, God was reconciling not just human beings, but the entire world back to God's self. And the good thing about that is that it's saying that the whole of the earth is important and it's recovering parts of the wisdom tradition and other traditions that show that God's spirit is present in the whole of creation, that all of creation matters to God. It's getting away from the focus uh, of the kind of Christianity that I was first converted into that says God is only interested in human beings and the world is simply a backdrop on which we live our lives until we uh, get to go to the proper place, to heaven. It emphasizes the fact that uh, in the Christian scriptures, the final days are about God coming down here on earth and bringing peace on earth among us. So the good thing about a lot of Christian eco-theology, from my way of looking at it, is that it emphasizes the importance of the rest of creation. Where I probably differ from the other speakers today is that I don't think Jesus fits into that in the way that uh, has been commonly understood. So the idea that in Christ, the pre-existent Christ, all things hang together and all things are redeemed only makes sense if we believe that there's something wrong with all things and that they need salvation. That somehow this world, uh, which included pain and death and extinction, is wrong and needs to be redeemed. Instead, I think the world was the way it was meant to be for billions of years. And it wasn't until human beings came along that something shifted enough to need the kind of intervention that Christians talk about uh, in the life of Jesus. And it doesn't really matter whether you see Jesus as the second person of the Trinity or simply as a human being who fully understood uh, God's message of love and was brave enough to live it out completely, even to the point of death. I probably lean to the latter interpretation, but it doesn't really matter. The heretical story that I want to talk about as an introduction to this idea is Jesus' story of the sheep and the, of the one lost sheep. I went looking to see uh, how people interpreted it, and pretty much without exception found it interpreted to basically say it's a story of the one sheep uh, that's saved, which is everybody, uh, and the 99 sheep who think they need no salvation. Almost nobody takes the story uh, at face value as it's uh, recorded for us about the one sheep who needs to be found and the 99 sheep who actually need no salvation. Because of course it's very hard for Christianity to tolerate the idea that most people in the world don't need salvation. Particularly if we're influenced by Paul's theology, everybody needs salvation. So the story can't possibly mean what it seems to mean and Jesus must have been being ironic. But I want to suggest that maybe he wasn't. That not all human beings need salvation and the entire creation around us, the non-human creation, doesn't need salvation either. Not in that direct sense of there being something uh, corrupt, uh, something fundamentally wrong with it that needs to be changed or redeemed. Certainly the creation is groaning along with much of humanity, certainly we need some kind of salvation, but it's not that kind of uh, moral salvation or change in our nature or change in the nature of creation. What I want to suggest is that what happened, what, what has happened, is happening 
uh, amongst human beings at the moment is that some of us, and a growing proportion of us perhaps, are isolating ourselves from life around us through the two billion dollar buildings, through plane travel, through all of the things we do to maintain the illusion that we are not part of life and going to return to the dust. Because as we do that and as we use our technologies to do that, we inflict a whole lot of suffering on other human beings and on the rest of creation. All of the technologies that we have come at a great cost, not just the burning of coal, but also the mining of materials. And increasingly, those of us with technology are able to reap the benefits of that technology and maintain the illusion of our separation from the rest of creation, while passing that cost on to the rest of creation and to the poor humans among us. In fact, because humans are fundamentally a part of the family of life, that we are evolutionary connected to all things, I think it makes more sense to talk about the very small percentage of humans who constitute the rich in much of what Jesus talked about, and everyone else, the poor. The poor being not just poor humans, but all of the creatures around us who are also poor, who suffer um, because of the actions of the few. In fact, Pope Francis in his encyclical, in his second paragraph, uh, has some really radical things to say about the earth as being not only our sister, but the earth as the poor. He then kind of retreats from that in the rest of the encyclical. But if you read that second passage, uh, it's a really uh, amazing and strong statement about the fundamental connection between poor humans and the rest of the earth. So we live in a world where 1% of humanity controls over 50% of our wealth and where the poorest half of human beings have about 1% of our wealth. It's not an exact parallel and I'm not trying to say that this is exactly what Jesus was talking about, but it's interesting to think about our world in terms of the 1% and the 99% and Jesus' parable of the one sheep who needed salvation and the 99 who didn't. That 1% who have completely isolated themselves, or at least as far as it's possible, from the rest of life around them. The rich, the very, very rich, who are the target of so many of Jesus' warnings, that by seeking wealth, they're cutting themselves off from their community, but by cutting themselves off from the community and from the rest of life, they're also cutting themselves off from God. They are the ones who need salvation, to be liberated from their fear of death so that they can let go of all of the wealth and resources that they're hoarding to maintain the illusion of immortality. As that 1% are saved and liberated and give up their wealth and turn and follow Jesus, then a kind of secondary salvation flows to the rest of us. The poor find liberation because no longer does 1% of the world control half of the wealth, but all of us began, begin to get to share wealth more equally. So we see an image of Genesis 1, where everyone is created in God's image and therefore everyone has access to the world's resources. And the rest of creation finds salvation not in the removal of death, not in the end of mutation or extinction, not in some fundamental change in the way the world is, but finds liberation because no longer are they being oppressed to maintain the wealth and privilege of the very few. Think about battery hens, think about just about all of the animals that we eat uh, in some way or other or use the products of. Many, many of them cry out for liberation because they're caged or stuck in pens simply for our convenience to make it cheaper uh, for us to have food. They cry out for liberation. As humanity is liberated, starting with the richest, starting with that one lost sheep, so too they might eventually find liberation. The creatures who are having their homes destroyed constantly through land clearing so that we can make cheaper and cheaper fuels and foods for ourselves, find liberation as humanity learns their limits, again starting with those who have most forgotten what their limits are. Now, of course, I'm not saying that there's only 1% of humans who are in that category. I'm sitting here talking into a video camera about to jump on a plane and fly down to Adelaide. There's part of the 1% in me as well but less so than the actual 1%. And there are humans who are living in a much better relationship with the rest of creation than I, am, than I am, who are part of life, who always have been. If we switch parables to the prodigal son, 
They are the older brother who never left the family, who have always lived well in creation and need no salvation. The rest of us are the younger brother who took our share of the family's wealth before our time and went off and wasted it and have ended up finding ourselves in the climate change pig pen. Will the younger brother come to his senses again and return to the family and learn to live well? Will humanity finally listen to the message of Jesus, the dangers of wealth, that it's harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to get through the eye of the needle? Will we finally accept the fact that the needle wasn't some gate somewhere in Israel that simply made it hard for rich people to get into heaven, but he actually meant a needle? Will we finally turn and repent, live a life within the means of the earth family, celebrate with the rest of the earth family our limits rather than spending billions and billions of dollars trying to deny them. The hope for creation, in other words, doesn't hinge upon some mystical interpretation of Jesus as being uh, someone who brought the creation together before the beginning of the world, although if that's the way you want to see it, that's fine. But the real hope for creation is that human beings will actually start to listen to the teachings and emulate the lifestyle of the Jesus who walked among us, who brought warnings to the rich and hope to the poor. Not just poor humans, but all the poor creatures with whom we share this planet.